The Bible's going to be opened, and we're going to be encouraged as he comes and speaks to us on the topic of Jesus and the church. Brother Clark. It is a delight to be with you tonight and to be here at uh, East Hill again. Always a delight to be here, and especially a delight tonight to have heard the sermon we just heard. I think you would agree with me that uh, it would be wonderful if the whole world could hear that message. And Brother Hickson does such a great job all the time. And I'm privileged to be able to sit down in the studio with him and just talk the Bible. I don't know how I uh, was given the honor of uh, being able to work with him all those years ago, but uh, we've always had just a natural rapport. In fact, I've told people many times when the camera is not rolling, we're usually doing the same thing we're doing when the camera's rolling, just quieter. <laughs> we're talking Bible, and uh, I just love uh, being with him and working with him and certainly appreciate the great work that he did in this presentation tonight. And I'm also grateful for young men who are making it possible for messages like that to get out far and wide. And I'm really grateful for this good looking group of people over here. Uh, and I'm not just talking about uh, the wives who are with the students tonight. The students look pretty good too. And they do uh, mean so much to us. I don't get to uh, be with them in person as much here lately as I would normally be because I've been out speaking a good bit, uh, but I've been able to still teach by way of uh, zooming in for a class and then getting in there about once a week to teach. And so we do get to be together on a regular basis, but I do miss them, miss getting to see them. And I'm so proud of them. Uh, the, we need preachers in this world. Oh, we need preachers. I can't tell you how many times I get a call from an eldership, Brother Clark, can you send us a preacher? And oh, how I wish I had more to send. And there's a way for us to be able to send more, and that's to uh, have more motivated to get the training necessary to preach the word. And we'd sure love to help some folks do that, and we're grateful for those who already are getting that training, not just at Memphis, but in any faithful school of preaching. We need preachers all over the world, and so I'm grateful for every place where they're being trained and taught the truth in a good way. I could not believe my ears. I was at a preacher's luncheon in East Tennessee years ago now, and one of the preachers for the Lord's Church stood up to speak to the rest of the preachers for the Lord's Church in this particular setting, and his presentation began with these words, brethren, I have decided to quit preaching the church and start preaching Christ. Now, how do you do that? Are you going to preach the blood of Christ? Well, yes, of course, because the blood is what washes our sins away, Revelation 1 and verse 5. And yeah, it's through the blood that we have forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, Ephesians 1, 7. So you're going to preach the blood of Christ? Yes, I am. Are you going to preach what the blood of Christ purchased? Well, what did the blood of Christ purchase, you ask? You know the answer. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, what did he purchase with his own blood? He purchased the church. How in the world could you preach Christ without preaching his blood? And if you preach his blood, you're going to have to preach what is blood purchased, and that's his church, the body of the church. As a matter of fact, Christ is the head, we know from Colossians 1.18 and Ephesians 1.22 and 23. Is the head connected to anything? Well, of course it is. The head, Christ, is connected to the body. So I'm not going to decapitate the body and isolate the head 
and focus only on the head as if it has no body, and I'm not going to focus only on the body and ignore the head. You see, this isn't an either-or proposition. It's a both-and proposition. It's not either we preach Christ or we preach the church. If we preach Christ, we will preach the church. Because Jesus bled and died for it to purchase it and to become its head. And there are so many relationships that are connected to Jesus Christ and his church tonight that I want to address them with you this evening. And number one, I've already alluded to. Number one, he is the head of the body. Now, to show you how big of a deal this is, Ephesians 5.23 says he's the Savior of the body. So, if you tell me we're not going to preach the church, the body of Christ is the church according to Ephesians 1.22 and 23. Now, let's put two and two together here. If I'm not going to preach the church, then I'm not going to preach the body because the body is the church. If I'm not going to preach the body, I'm not going to preach the location of salvation because Ephesians 5.23 says he's the Savior of something. Of what is he the Savior? He is the Savior of the body. And so to preach the body is to preach the location of salvation. But it's not to leave the head out because the body's connected to the head, Jesus Christ. And so if I preach Christ... I'll preach salvation in Christ. Well, guess what the body is connected to? It is part of Christ. It's the body of the body belonging to Christ. So I'm going to preach the church. I'm going to preach Jesus as the head of the church, and that will give me the opportunity to preach salvation in the body. Let me give you an illustration that my dad always used to use when I'd grow up hearing him and even in more recent times, I can always fondly remember him using this illustration. If you have a big glass jug right here, and you say that that big glass jug represents Christ, and you've got half of that jug filled up with water, and you say that the water represents the church, then I could conceivably, because it's only half full, I could stick my hand down into the jug without touching the water, and thus I could be in Christ without being in the church, because the water is represented in this illustration by the church, or the church is represented by the water. And so I could stick my hand in the very top of the jar not get it wet at all, and still, based on the illustration, be considered to be in Christ, but not in the church. But would you look at Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23? God gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Watch it now. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. If the church, if the body is the fullness of him that filleth all in all, then I need to fill that jug up to the very top. I need to have the water right there at the brim so that if the jug represents Christ and the water represents the church and I'm trying to stick my hand into the jug I can't stick my hand into the jug without sticking it also into the water because it's right there at the very, it's full. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. And the moment I stick my hand into Christ is the moment I'm sticking my hand into the body of Christ, the church, because they're inseparable. You can't be saved outside of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice, I'm not talking about a denomination among denominations. I'm talking about the actual church that Jesus started in Acts chapter 2. And there wasn't a single soul saved on that day that was saved without being added to something. What were they added to according to Acts 2.47? The Lord added to the church. So if you're saved, you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're in the church because the body is connected to Christ. And you can't be in the body without being in Christ. Now, let me ask you this question, simple question. Where does your blood circulate, inside your body or outside of it? Well, 
obviously inside your body. In order to get to the blood then, I need to get inside your body to get to your blood. Okay? Where does the blood of Christ circulate? Within his spiritual body or outside of his spiritual body? Obviously within his spiritual body. If I need the blood of Christ, and I do in order to be saved, then I need to get into the body where the blood circulates. And so number one tonight, he is the head of the body, and as such, he gets to make decisions. Now, you'll notice that I just went like this, and I wasn't even deliberately in my mind thinking, okay, now I'm going to go like this. My mind is controlling what I'm saying. My mind is controlling the gestures that I'm giving. My elbow isn't telling the rest of me what to do. My elbow will bend as I command it to based on what my head is telling my body to do. So the head is in charge. And so many people in some places today in the body of Christ seem to have forgotten who's in charge. The church does not tell the head what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. The church is submissive to the head He's the head of the body, and so we listen to him when it comes to how to worship. We listen to him when it comes to how to organize the church. We listen to him when it comes to how to uh, finance the work of the church, etc. He's in charge, and he gets to make all the decisions, and I gladly submit and bow before him. I listen to his orders and do what he asks. So here's the second thing tonight. He is king of his kingdom. Now, way back in 2 Samuel 7, Daniel, excuse me, David, had this idea. David had this idea that he was going to build a temple, a house for God. And he tells Nathan the prophet about it. And Nathan the prophet at first says, you ought to do that. And then God gets a hold of Nathan the prophet and says, I didn't tell you to tell David to do that. No, David's not going to build me a house. I'm going to build him one with one of his descendants. In fact, you go back and tell David this. And so Nathan goes back and tells David what? 2 Samuel 7, 12, and 13. When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. In other words, when you live the last day on earth you're going to live. After that, one of your descendants, he says, someone that comes from your flesh, I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house for my name. And he'll be on the throne of that kingdom forever. And that's how we know Solomon can't be the ultimate fulfillment in view here. Solomon would build a temple, yes, but a greater than Solomon would come along and build a greater temple, as we'll see a little bit later in this message. But we have a king who is anointed, and uh, Jesus Christ talked about a coming kingdom. In fact, he and John the baptizer in Mark chapter 1, 14 and 15, and Matthew chapter 3, early part of the chapter, they're both going around saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near. It's almost here. Do you know that you have religious friends and loved ones and neighbors, just as do I, who would tell us the kingdom that Jesus meant to establish? He just hadn't gotten, he's not able, he wasn't able to establish it the first time. He, he wanted to, but he was unexpectedly rejected by the Jews and so it's plan B, the church age, and then you come back to heaven and someday we'll end the church age with the rapture and then there'll be seven years of tribulation on the earth and Antichrist will be wreaking havoc all over the place and then at the end of that seven years, the saints and I will go back down and we'll win the battle of Armageddon, defeat the Antichrist, dethrone Satan, and we will set up a kingdom on earth for a 1,000-year period. I'm telling you, that is what a good portion of people in this religious world believe is going to happen. They've seen it in the movies, and they've read it in the books, 
and their preacher told them so and so and such and such and so they buy it and they just take it hook, line, and sinker. But what they don't realize is that the kingdom was established a long time ago just as Jesus promised it would be. Do you remember what Jesus said in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1? He said, there be some of them that stand here. And that was in the first century that he said that. Mark 9, 1. There be some of them that stand here, what? Which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come. And how will it come? With power. So picture this. You've got some first century people listening to Jesus say, some of you hearing me say these words will still be alive when the kingdom comes. If Jesus told the truth, and is there anyone here tonight who wants to say he didn't? If he didn't tell the truth, then he can't be my Savior because he would have been a sinner in need of a Savior. No, he told the truth. But if he told the truth, then one of two things happened. Either the kingdom was established in the first century lifetime of those people that heard him say it, or some of the people that heard him say it, or at least one of them, some of them, he says, some that stand here, some of them would have to be alive on earth tonight in the year 2022 so they make Methuselah look like a little kindergarten boy. Or, wait a minute, Jesus, how did you say your kingdom would come? With, with power. Did you ever tell the apostles from whence this power would come? Yes. In Luke 24, 49, he told them, tarry in the city of Jerusalem. Why? You stay there until what? Until you be endued with power. Well, the kingdom's coming with power, yes. And the power's coming from on high. Luke 24, 49. So now we're getting warmer. They'll be in Jerusalem when power from on high will come upon the apostles in particular. All right, do we ever know what the sign would be that the power had come? Yeah. Acts 1.8, Jesus said to the apostles before he ascended, he said, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you. And so the apostles in Acts 2 are gathered there on the day of Pentecost they're the nearest antecedent to the they of Acts 2.1. That's the apostles of Acts 1.26. And when they were there, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And those apostles spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so now we're getting warmer. The kingdom will come with power. Jesus, you said the kingdom would come when you built your church, right? Yes, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. My subject tonight is Jesus and his church. Do you know that if they had assigned me the subject, Jesus and his kingdom, I'd be preaching the very same outline. I wouldn't be changing it up as if, oh, those are two entirely different things. And I don't know why some of my brethren seem to be so determined to try to divorce the identity of the church from the identity of the kingdom. I know in Matthew 16, 18, and 19 they're equivalent because Jesus isn't going to build one thing and give the keys to something else to the apostles. In that passage, he would build the church and give them the keys to the kingdom what uh, did David hear from Nathan? When you're dead and buried, one of your descendants is going to establish a kingdom and build a house. Well, is the house the church? Ask Paul. 1 Timothy 3.15. If I tarry long, I want you to know how you ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is what? which is the church of the living God. And so, David, one of your descendants is going to build me a house, establish me a kingdom, and it will be my house, Isaiah 2, 2 calls it the Lord's house. And it would be established in Jerusalem. The word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem, according to uh, Isaiah chapter 2, 2 and 3. And so now we're getting warmer. Can we find a time when the apostles are in Jerusalem being endued with power from on high and uh, then seeing the kingdom arrive on that day, the house, the church. 
Well, we also need to find David dead and buried. And I want you to please go with me to the book of Acts chapter 2. Even though some mockingly refer to our emphasis on Acts 2 as some kind of a glaring, embarrassing mark of being a member of the Church of Christ, actually attended a debate years ago where the participant on the side of error said, if you ever want to know if a Bible belongs to a member of one of the churches of Christ, there is an easy test. He said, just take said Bible, just let it fall open where it will, and if they're a member of the church of Christ, it'll fall open to Acts 2 every time, he said, and thought that was hilarious. Mine fell open to Ezekiel 41. Well, I'm a member of the church and not ashamed at all. And I'm telling you, if it had fallen open to Acts 2, I wouldn't have said, oh, no. He went on to say, they have a greasy spot in their Bible on the pages of Acts 2. Their fingerprints are on those pages so many times. Friends, are you embarrassed to have your fingers all over, your fingerprints all over the page where all the Lord's prophecies and planning of the coming church would finally come to fruition? Is that something about which to be ashamed or something about which to rejoice? I'm grateful that I can go to my Bible and I can find the power coming from on high while the apostles are in Jerusalem, just as Isaiah predicted it would go forth from Jerusalem. And I'm, I'm also glad that I can see Something that happened a thousand years earlier being emphasized as if it's some important news. But it wasn't breaking news. Look at Acts 2, 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried. Was there anyone on Pentecost that didn't know that? I tell you, if they didn't know that, where had they been? Okay, if they did know it, and they obviously did, can you tell me why Peter is bringing it up as if it's some big news? Oh, wait a minute. David, when you're dead and buried, one of your descendants is going to build me a house and establish a kingdom. David is dead and buried. Yes. And what was he promised would happen after his death and burial? One of his descendants would come and and build a house and establish a kingdom. In fact, hold your place in Acts 2, and let's get our fingerprints on Luke chapter 1 as well. Mary, some startling news for you. You're going to have a baby. Um, I, there's, that's not possible uh, biologically speaking. Well, it is miraculously speaking. The Holy Spirit's going to make you uh, conceive miraculously. And uh, you'll bring forth a son, verse 31 of Luke 1, you'll call him Jesus. He'll be great. He'll be called the son of the highest. And watch the last part of verse 32. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. David, when you're dead and buried, one of your descendants is going to establish a kingdom and build me a house. And watch verse 33 of Luke 1. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob. Isaiah, did you say anything about, yeah, the house of the God of Jacob is mentioned in Isaiah 2, 2, and 3. So this Jesus would reign over the house of Jacob forever, never step down and give it to anyone else, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So it's a house, it's a kingdom, it's a church. And that is exactly what we would expect to see. And so on the day of Pentecost, when Peter then says in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 30, therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up, does your Bible say Solomon? He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne and someone says, oh yeah, he's going to sit on David's throne all right, but that's going to be on earth when he comes back for his millennial reign. Friends, if you believe the Bible, then you know it can't be on earth that he reigns because of this. 
Zechariah 6, 12 and 13 prophetically says that at the same time he is ruling on his throne, he would be a priest. And Hebrews 8, 4 says if he were on earth, he could not be a priest. So there you go. He can't reign on earth because the Bible says at the same time he's on his throne, he's going to be a priest, but he can't be a priest on earth. Is he a high priest? Our great high priest, Hebrews 4.14, has passed into the heavens. He's high priest right now. Is he right now king of kings and lord of lords? Let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made the same Jesus you crucified, both Lord and Christos, Messiah anointed one. The king has just gotten his kingdom. Do you remember when the apostles saw Jesus leave them? He left with the clouds. Do you remember what Daniel 7 predicted? Prophetically, Daniel saw something that would happen in the future. He saw the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days, back to the Father. He came with the clouds. And do you notice, do you remember Daniel 7, 14? What was given to this Son of Man when he got back to the Ancient of Days, when he came to heaven? Do you remember what the next verses say was given to him? There was given unto him a kingdom. Ah, we have a king right now. His name is Jesus. And I love Revelation chapter 1 because it says to you and says to me that we were made to be, and the American Standard Version renders this, he made us to be a kingdom. That's what we have been made. We've been made kings and priests unto God, or a kingdom unto God and his Father. He is reigning right now as Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and I do not need, I do not need for him to take the throne as if he's not yet been sitting on it. No, he's already on the throne. And do you know what some of our religious friends try to do with these passages that depict him on a throne? They say, well, yeah, but that's the Father's throne. It's like he's sitting on the armrest of the Father's throne. My Bible says that's not true. He would never reign in Judah. Jeremiah, did you tell us anything about how to know when the king would be in his kingdom and where that kingdom would be and where it would not be? O oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. And Jeremiah then says... This man, Coniah, Jeconiah, write him childless. Regally, he'll never have a child to sit on the throne in Judah. This man, Coniah, will never have a descendant to reign on the throne in Judah. Well, guess who just so happens to be? Descendant of Jeconiah, according to Matthew 1, 12. It's Jesus. Well, that just by itself demolishes the view that Jesus is ever going to be sitting on a throne in Judah, in Jerusalem, which is a part of Judah, because according to the Bible, he can't. He doesn't have to. It doesn't say, by the way, he'd never reign on the throne. It says he'd never do it in Judah. He's on the throne right now, king, right now. So I know he's king of his kingdom. He's head of his body. Next, he's bridegroom of his bride. Do you know that before God ever made Eve to be the bride of Adam, he had already determined there would be another bride that would come someday? I know this because the church is called the bride of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Ephesians chapter 5 compares the marriage relationship to the relationship between Christ and his church. Husbands, love your wives. And uh, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, and the church was in the eternal purpose of God. So before God ever said, I'm going to make Eve for Adam, he'd already said in his mind, I'm going to make a bride for the Word who will become flesh and dwell among men. If you go to the book of Revelation chapter 21, I love this little Passage in Revelation 21, 9. 
Here we find it. John, what did you see this time? Well, there came unto me one of the seven angels, verse 9 of Revelation 21. This is one of the seven angels that had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. And so many people get tripped up by some of the minutia of this and miss the bigger point here. He talked with John, and what did he say to John? He said, come with, come with me, come hither, come here. I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Who's the lamb? Well, you know that. Behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, John 1, The lamb of God is Jesus, and he has a wife. Who's his wife? It's not a physical wife that produced physical offspring with him, no. This is spiritual. It's a spiritual relationship. It is the relationship between Christ and his church. He is the bridegroom, and the church is his bride. How many brides did you have come walking down the aisle at your wedding? I only expected and wanted one to come walking down the aisle at mine. I can guarantee you, I was not looking for two. How many, how many brides did God present Adam with on the day that uh, he made Eve and gave her away to the man? How many brides did Adam receive? One. And so this idea that Christ has all kinds of different churches with all kinds of different doctrines as his bride, and they're all different brides of Christ or part of the bride of Christ is simply out of kilter with Scripture. It is not what the Bible teaches. Now, it says he gave himself for it. What did he give for his bride? What would you give for yours? If, if it came right down to it, would you give up your life for your bride? Well, I can tell you this. He gave his blood, sweat, and tears for his bride. I see that in the Garden of Gethsemane with the bloody sweat. I can tell you that he gave his back for his bride because they beat him across the back with the scourge and he was willing to give his back for his bride. I can tell you he gave his face for his bride because they slugged him in the face and slapped him and asked him to predict who did it because they blindfolded him as if that was something that would keep him from knowing. And he, he gave his face. His visage was marred, according to Isaiah's prophecy. He gave his head. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. I see the crown of thorns slammed down into his scalp. And I see the blood that pours forth from his head. I see them nailing him to a tree and the blood that flows from his hands. I see his feet being nailed to the cross, so from head to toe, he gave himself. How much of himself did he give? He gave it all. I don't know if you've ever heard this about this young boy that was told by his parents, your brother needs a blood transfusion, and, and you have the same blood type as your brother. Would, would you be willing to make a donation? For my brother, I will do it, yes. And so they're in the hospital waiting for the procedure to begin. And the boy looks at his daddy and he says, Daddy, how long will it take? And his dad thinks he's talking about the procedure. And then the boy interrupts and says, No, Daddy, how long will it take after they take my blood until I die? <laughs> until you die. Son, they're, they're not taking all of your blood. But the boy thought they were going to and was willing to give it anyway for his brother. Wow. And then I think about Jesus. He didn't give me a pint of his blood. He gave it all. He bled out for you and for me. He bled out for his bride. That's the kind of bridegroom that he is. And so what do I want to give him back? I give him my mind. I love him with all of my heart, my soul, my strength, my mind. I give him my ears. Whosoever hath ears to hear, let him hear. The book of Revelation says multiple times. I give him my mouth. I control what I say. 
and I don't let any corrupt speech proceed out of my mouth, according to Ephesians 4.29. My speech is seasoned with salt, so to speak, Colossians 4.6. I tell the truth with my mouth. I'm not found lying, and I give him my hands. I give him my hands of service. My feet go to the services to worship him. They go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Because he gave it all for me, my precious blood I shed, that thou mightst ransom be and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. And then you know the question, don't you? What have you given for me? He deserves all that I can give. He is number next, the shepherd of his sheep. And what a good shepherd he is. He calls himself the good shepherd in John 10 and verse 11. And I don't know if you've ever read it or not, and I can't endorse everything that's in it because there's some Calvinism that leaks into this. But this guy by the name of Keller that used to be a shepherd actually wrote a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. And some of the aspects of what a shepherd does and how they fit so beautifully into that text are well worth your while and your investigation, but spit out the bones if you come across, when you come across them. But recognize we have such a shepherd that he does indeed make us to lie down in in green pastures. He restores our soul. He gives us everything that we need. He's always leading us into the safe way, not the dangerous way. He's the shepherd of his sheep. And he's the great shepherd, Hebrews 13, 20 would call him. And he has one flock. He says, I'm the good shepherd. We got One flock brought under the shepherd. So notice the oneness that we keep seeing in all of these analogies. He's the master of his vineyard. Yes, that's why as I think about all that he's asked me to do, I want to do everything I can for him. And I want to say and mean it and I want to live it out in my life. You know that song we sing that says, I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of my Lord. He is the master of the vineyard that's going to ask me to give an account for what I've done someday in that vineyard. And we as members of his vineyard need to be able to. And then he is the foundation and cornerstone of his temple. Solomon, you build a magnificent temple. Yes, and it's a a sight to see. I mean, the magnificence of it is really something to behold. And the Babylonians came and torched it. And so what men can build, men can destroy. Would there ever be a descendant of David who would build a temple that men can't touch? Friends, Jesus Christ is his name. The church is his temple, Ephesians 2, 20 to 22. And tell me, if the powers of the earth were to combine all their forces together to destroy the kingdom, the church of our Lord. Tell me where they would point the bombs. Where? You say, well, Nashville, Tennessee, friends. Nashville's got a lot of churches that would be churches of Christ, some faithful and some not. But I'm telling you, that the church of our Lord is not confined to any one location. There's no headquarters for the church here on earth. Our, our citizenship's in heaven, Philippians 3. And they can't touch my s- treasures that are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. That is where I'm going someday. And they can't touch anything that I have there that's awaiting me. No matter what this world throws at me, I am never afraid because I know that when I die, I, in a split second, the moment I die, I'm going to know joy like I've never known it before. Even the greatest earthly joy cannot compare to the glory of the joys that I'll enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Yes, indeed. And then finally, he's the commander in chief of his army. Look, I I don't enjoy fighting any more than you do, but I need to endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight, but fight the good fight of faith. 
and I need to stand up for Jesus, stand up for Jesus, and do exactly what he's asked me to do. Years ago, I read about an atheist who came to a town to rail against the existence of God and to absolutely level any one there that was an ignoramus enough to believe in the existence of God. And he spoke to a packed house. And when he finished, a couple children in the balcony that started singing, stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. And those out of the mouth of babes, those children started singing that. The adults started singing it. And the story that I read some years ago says that the atheist went off the stage in a huff because Pretty soon, just about everyone there was singing, stand up, stand up for Jesus. In this world today that is so antagonistic to Christ and his church, we're going to have to be willing to stand up, stand up for Jesus. And that's what uh, being a Christian is about, loyalty to our Savior and standing up for him. Listen, the relationship between Jesus and his church is so precious it is indeed precious indeed. I cannot believe that someday I actually get to go live with him. I know, and it's okay with me, I'm never going to be invited to come and live in the house of some rich man and just not have to pay a bill from now on the rest of my life. I'm never going to have an earthly location where I don't have any concerns at all about where the money's coming from for the next thing I need to purchase or the next mortgage I need to pay. Someday I'm going to, listen, I, I have something much better than that. I've got a Savior and I've got a location, a home in heaven that is awaiting me and I don't have any material concerns tonight that are greater than those treasures I have in heaven. And so, it's my privilege tonight to extend heaven's invitation to you, to say on behalf of your king, on behalf of the head of the body you'll become a member of if you enter the church, to say on behalf of the commander-in-chief of the army, to say on behalf of the master of the vineyard, indeed, to speak on behalf of the head of the body and the king of the kingdom, and to say, there's room for more. Why don't you become a living stone in that temple? First Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 talks about us being living stones in a temple that we're trying to add more and more people to. And yes, the days of the Roman kings came and went. Daniel 2.44 says that in the days of those Roman kings, that's when a kingdom would be established without hands that would never be destroyed, and that's God's kingdom, and it's greater than any earthly power, conglomeration of powers could ever be. The greatest thing you could ever be a member of is a member of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of Christ. Won't you think about that tonight if you're not already a member and, and leave a member of the church? If you're already a member, as most of us here tonight are, I'm asking you to think about what I'm, I'm supposed to be doing until I get to go live with Jesus. I'm trying to bring as many folks with me as possible, and you and I need to be doing that together. But make sure you're going. We love you. He loves you. He bled for you, bled out for you. If you need to respond to him, look to him now and obey the gospel or be restored as together we stand and sing, won't you please?